Hey folks, uh, my name is Travis and I wanted to uh, introduce you to Provision, a new specialty market that we opened up at the Pasquals on East Washington Avenue. Um, so we're a place that you can pick up some of your Pasquals favorites, salsas, chips, dips, sauces, prepared meal kits, um, and other prepared foods, um, as well as grocery items to complete your taco night or uh, an Italian dinner, pastas, pasta sauces, and of course spirits, margarita supplies, um, craft beer, local imported, um, put together some gift sets for uh, holiday time, um, local treats from folks like Gail Ambrosius and Nutcrack, yeah, we're uh, just hoping to become a nice neighborhood spot um, when you're stopping in for a meal or live in the neighborhood and need something to bring to a dinner party or just uh, finish Taco Tuesday. So we hope to see you soon. Hey, Madison, thanks for joining us tonight for another edition of Cooking with the Cap Times. I am here with Lindsay Christians, Cap Times food editor, and we've got Chef, Chef Sean, I can't say that, I'm a dang, uh, of Mintmark. And I'm going to pass it off to these guys in just a second, but first I want to thank the sponsors who helped make this series possible month after month. We have our presenting sponsor, Provision Market at Pasquale's Cantina. You can shop the newly opened market on East Washington. Uh, and go to their website to check out store hours, but during the next uh, Packer game, you want to stop by, get some stuff. Of course, if you get some Mintmar takeout, you know, all the things. Um, but also, we want to thank our official brewery sponsor. Our official beer is the Oso Brewing Company Redheaded Stepchild this month. We're going to give away a couple <laughs> four packs to some lucky viewers at home. So our colleague Chris Murphy is going to drop the link in the chat where you can enter to win some beer. It is a sour ale. Very what, delicious. Does it have things in it? it cherries. Has, it's got uh, cherries in it. Cherries. It's good. It's <laughs> Uh, you guys, win it. You're going to want to win it. Um, and then tonight we are also at Kessenix, the official kitchen sponsor of Cooking with the Cap Times. You can shop like a chef here at Kessenix. It's always open to the public, so stop by. It's pretty amazing in here. And also, we want to make sure that you guys know about Cap Times members, because we want to thank them especially. They support the work that we do at the Cap Times. Our journalists, our reporters in the newsroom, but also they help support series like this, Cooking with the Cap Times. So if you love what you see here tonight and want to support this series yourself, you can go to membership.captimes.com and give any amount to become a Cap Times member and support this series. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to step aside. If you have questions tonight, feel free to comment those in the chat and I'll read them out loud. But I'm going to pass it off to Chef and Lindsay. Thank you. Sorry for the like, weird, like, you know, popping into the camera thing earlier. I was like, you're producing <laughs> me and no one can see me. And I don't know. I, I just, it was the anxiety move. That's great. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not Lindsay, so I was close. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome. Hi. I just Thanks want to tell me. everybody at home, I know, like, it's triggering for me right now to see people unmask. We both tested right before the show. Big negativo. We are big negative, so we are doing great. We've got a fully masked and antigen tested crew here. I just, like, if I was at home, that's what I would be wanting to know. So I'm telling you, um, because that's where I'm at right now. Um, thank you for being here, as I said. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so first of all, I wanted you to introduce yourself a little bit to folks. So. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean Farr. I'm the chef owner of Mint Mark in Madison and also uh, part owner of the Muska Lounge over on uh, Monona and Buckeye, uh, the Muska Lounge and Sporting Club. Uh, I've been open in Madison now for about four years with Mint Mark. Um, had an incredibly uh, great run. Um, super happy to be here and uh, super happy to be in that community. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful space to be in. And we've just had a, a great ride so far. So yeah. yeah, it's great. I feel like I'm always looking up whether the shortening of musky is M-U-S-K-Y or I-E. We I decided kinda... at one point and Do I'm pretty sure. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm a big fan of the M-U-S-K-I-E, mm. but I think it might be the M-U-S-K-Y. I think you might be right. I think, yeah. The thing about the muskie was that we would actually go and like even sit outside like into November. Yeah. 
because yeah. you know we were sitting inside for a long time. No, we weren't allowed to. No, and, and so we would just like go. We were like, this is our new neighborhood bar because we live right in that neighborhood. And we were like, well, we can't go in. So we would like look at the beautiful murals. Yeah. From the outside. No, it was it was super tough. Uh, Chad and I opened up three days after the orders were given that nobody could step foot into a bar. Oh man. And because we didn't serve food, we you know except for for Boney's frozen pizzas, which are delicious and. Really proud to be serving those. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we thought that would maybe do it, but no. Uh, so we had this 150 person bar with incredible murals and just beautiful woodwork. And you all had to sit out on a concrete slab. And we everybody did. did, and I'm so thankful. We did, we sat up there. And then just like that, everybody was allowed back in and it's just been awesome yeah. since then. Yeah. yeah, shuffleboard leagues and ping pong tournaments and foosball leagues. Um, yeah, it's just, it's great. I remember great. there was like a blow up thing to watch sports on too. Like yeah, a we had a, a, a huge uh, TV screen for Packer games outside. Um, yeah, I mean, we were, I mean, everybody was just trying to do whatever they could. And mm -hmm. uh, again, the community really helped out and, you know, I'm super thankful. It's, you know, all of our regulars at Mintmark drove the six minutes to the Muskie and, uh, and drank there. And um, yeah, we're just, we're super fortunate to be where we're at. And I'm thankful to, to have those spaces still, they still made it, and you know, yeah, yeah it's great. Do it well already for Mittmark. Nice. I love Mittmark. I hope you bring the Friday lunches back someday. Oh man, David, you find me some cooks, maybe we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about uh, Mittmark going to like a different kind of takeout for a while during the pandemic was that I remember because you know, I, I'd sort of gotten to know the bartenders because I hang out a lot. Yeah. Um, the corner with the cribbage table. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. It's, yeah. The, it's our thing. That's um, awesome. But anyway, I would talk to the bartenders and they were like, there are people who have become Mint Mark regulars who have never been in here. Yeah, yeah, right? that's that's true. Yeah, that was that was neat to see as well. I think we uh, through that we we were able to reach a new audience. Um, and uh, that was kind of neat. I mean, it was just an interesting time. We we kind of turned into a sandwich shop. Yeah. And uh, we still kept to like the Mint Mark premise where we were changing the menu all the time and still working with the same farmers and same ingredients, uh, just putting it on sandwiches. Because if I put five roasted carrots in a little brown box, somebody's <laughs> gonna call me and be like, what the hell is this? Yes, you know, but yeah. if I spend time plating it, it's a different story, right? So it was a, we had to flip a little bit and we had to you know, get creative. And I feel like every restaurant was going through that, you know, like reinventing itself and trying to figure out what's going and throwing things at the wall to see if it sticks. And, you know, we found sandwich route and we found like the fried chicken thing and then fish fry. And we were tripling what we would sell in-house fish fries. Oh, wow. To go. So again, you know, a huge support from the community and like all those people that showed up three times a week anyway for dinner, hanging out for drinks, still ordered three times a week takeout. And, I mean, it was it was really neat to see the effect that a restaurant could have on a community like as a chef. And as a restaurateur, you don't really know. And maybe I just never experienced that working for other people in Chicago and running other restaurants, like the impact a space can have on your customers. Yeah. Um, you know, like you and Patrick in all the time, you know, yeah. and I'm thankful for that. And I have some other regulars that are in two or three times a week and it's it's their place. And they've, they've since then reached out to me to say like how special mm. Midmark is to them and like what it means and like that we are able to get through this so far and be there for them. And like, I never knew that like restaurants were there for other people. It was always a very like, well, this is here for me. Yeah. And this is my creative outlet. This is what I do. This is how I express myself. This is my craft. But if in return, it's like we created this thing that people need and want to be at. And like, right. to me, that's been the most rewarding part of all of this. Like, yeah. it's so cool to see that. The mad love, and I don't want it to go missed. Um, <laughs> Corinne Burgermeister, we love her from Destination Madison. Thanks for watching. Uh, she said, love Mint Mark and the Muskie. Judy Cross uh, Cost is watching and loves it as well. Liz Henry from J. Henry said, Aww, Liz. A, uh, a silver lining, right? Regulars who pick up love it. And then David again said, our neighbors loved Mint Mark so much, they got married there. Oh, oh my no. gosh. Uh, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, sort of two things. One, when I feel like when when Mint Mark did sort of you know have to close because of the pandemic, like for indoor, the first people that I thought of were like Belle and Mariah and, mm -hmm. and some of the spread of house people. And I think you know, as you say, like these restaurants become these places for our community 
too, and they become ours, right. the diners. Yeah, very much um, so. But I wanted to segue a little bit. So the first time I heard your name was before you came to Madison, and you were on a podcast with Rick Bayless. Yeah. And you did like yeah. this cooking challenge yeah. with Rick Bayless, where you both had to make something in like 15 minutes. Yeah, with um, lamb. I think lamb was the, uh -huh, that, the that secret ingredient. That sounds right, yeah. Man, that was like, it was one of the coolest moments. I mean, I, I don't know that I had ever listened to a podcast back yeah. then either. It was called like, The Feed, uh, yeah, Steve Dolinsky yep. and Rick Bayless. I the don't Hungry think it's, Hound. Yeah. Uh, revered and feared as a critic in Chicago. Uh, but uh, I got invited to do this thing and like, I. 10 years prior to that, I had started cooking in Madison. And I just, I, I got to tell Rick this really funny story for me. When I was at the um, farmer's market with one of my chefs, we were talking to a farmer who was selling tomatoes and he was like, oh, I sell tomatoes to Rick Bayless. And as a cook, I was like, oh my God, that's incredible. Because mm -hmm. in Madison, the only cooks back then you knew of were, or chefs were Rick Bayless and Charlie Trotter and Paul Kahn. Like that in the Midwest. Snug haven, anyway. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so like to me, I was like, oh, that's great. And I kind of cockily like said to the farmer, I was like, well, tell Rick I said, hey. And he goes, does he know you? And I'm like, no, but he will. <laughs> and then so 10 years or, you know, 12 years later, I got to tell Rick that story <laughs> on air. And like he just thought that was the best. And like to have him like agree with certain things I was talking about in theories with uh, cooking and teaching cooks, like, man, just. Oh, that was like one of the greatest <laughs> moments. And you walk into Frontera Studios and it's like there's a cook, a library for cooks and the whole like canning side of things. And then like the two or three restaurants, three restaurants next door to each other. Like it's just it was really cool. It yeah. was great. It was a great moment. Yeah. The the first time I went to, I think, Frontera Grill, Rick came out to our table yeah. and I was like, I am not someone who gets starstruck. Yeah. I'm fine. Like oh, I'm in the media, deal. you know. But it was still weird, you know. Like yeah. he's so classy. Cool. He there's no yeah. drama with him. He takes care of his cooks. I mean, I invited him in to the Bristol uh, where I was at at the time, and uh, he showed up two weeks later, and you know, came in, and I, you know, I got a call that like <laughs> Rick Bayless is here, and I was like <laughs> spoon spinning in the pot as I like bolted out the door, and um, you know, but like he. You know, he just, he had nothing but great things to say and he had some good feedback about stuff. And it just meant to me that he was like, he's just like kind of a cooking God mm -hmm. in North America and, and all over. And like the fact that he still took time to like mm. come out and, and, you know, eat my food and I don't know, he's just a great guy. I was yeah. really lucky to get to do that. But that also told me that you've done demos like this before. Oh yeah, it's not my first time on a boat. Right, sure. so when you were coming up with a recipe that you wanted to do for this, why did you choose this? Like, why this? Why now? Well, okay, so one thing, and this is kind of a big part of what Minmark is, is I am a sucker for traditional French cooking. A lot of what we do is based in traditional French technique mm -hmm. and then somewhat of an Italian intent. So by that, I mean everything is really hard for the cooks to prep and get up to service. And then when service time happens, like everything is kind of simple and perceived as uh, it's not very alienating and it's like, it's easy to understand when it comes out of the plate. There's no tricks, there's no dots. It's in the center of the plate instead of way off to the side, you know, <laughs> like it's just, it's just the way I, I view good food. And uh, so with this, you know, I, I feel like if, if I'm gonna teach something, it should be something people can do at home. And this might be something that uh, if you, you read the name, the Coca Van, it, it probably is perceived as being hard mm -hmm. and a lot of ingredients. So it just gets skipped right over and we'll just go right to putting the cream of mushroom soup over the chicken and throw it in the <laughs> oven, you know, which is delicious. But uh, so uh, I wanted to kind of demystify like uh, the difficulty of this dish. It's, it's really quite simple. You just need 12 more hours than you normally would. But I mean, you can do it right before you go to bed. You know? That's true, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of why I picked that. I did have, like um, Liz did ask or say, she's having trouble finding whole chickens as of late. Will you share your purveyor? Sure. Well, there's a couple spots that I go for whole chickens. Uh, if I just need to get one, uh, I will go to uh, my friend Pip and Jenny's at Meet People, uh, located in Madison's Hottest Strip Mall, right next to the Musculon <laughs> and Sporting Club. Uh, and also my buddy Dave Gathy over at Conscious Carnivore. Both of them purveyors of fine, locally raised uh, chickens. Um, 
the nice thing about this one, I mean, the, one of the, I did use a whole chicken for this dish and the traditional dish is using a whole like older chicken, like a stewing right, one, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you would have to braise the breast as well, which can toughen up. But I choose to just do the legs and thighs. So I saved the breast and made family meal at Mint Mark. We did chicken Alfredo for family meal today. Nice. <laughs> I dangerously ate like a pound of cream and cheese before I came here. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, use the bones for the stock, which we'll use a little bit here. But if you can just get your hands on legs and thighs, that's really neat. And uh, if I have to go grocery shopping for them, I always look for whatever the natural ones would be. Um, you know, try and avoid like the super commodity style stuff yeah. or like the giant legs and thighs where I don't know how that could possibly be a chicken. And I'd be terrified if I encountered it in the wild. Right. Kind of deal. So. Yeah. I when I was putting this recipe together and doing the edits on it, I, w I was like, oh, I want to give a weight, you know, for six, you know, leg thigh pieces. And I started looking up like Cook's Illustrated and they were talking about like it can be it can vary so widely. Yeah. And I was like, all right, we're just going to. We're going to say this and, and leave it alone. Yeah. yeah. So really like this, this recipe, like if you have four legs and thighs, it works. If you have two giant legs and thighs, it works. If you have a whole chicken, it works. Mm -hmm. Like you'll see like in the finished product, like this basically will cover a whole chicken. It could cover one and a half normal size chickens. So, um, and you can kind of feel it out. It's really forgiving. Like I gave measurements because I feel like people need to kind of have that kind of stuff to grab onto. But after you start learning this dish, it's kind of like, it's like good old school French cooking. You just kind of throw it in there and you kind of know what's going on. And right. if you don't have a half pot of bacon, all right, you know, you'll it be It reminds right. me sort of both of chicken cacciatore and also uh, like beef burgundy because you've got, you know, your pearl onions and the, the bacon and the... Yeah. 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 It's all the same, <laughs> yeah, right? It's like... Yeah, it's all the same connected. fundamentals of yeah, cooking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's get going. Let's do it. Great. Okay. So right off the bat, I had everything cut for time's sake and, and good to go. The first ingredient that you're going to need is your chicken legs and thighs. And after you get the coffee made and your kid's lunch is packed, <laughs> you know, and you get the dog put away in the pen, you grab the bottle of wine that you maybe didn't finish throughout that day to get through getting your kids to bed. And... You cover the legs and thighs with the wine and you stick some sprigs of thyme in there, some bay leaves and uh, a, a white onion. And I actually added carrots to this dish. Traditionally carrots had in there, but I, I love like braised carrots. Same. Um, and it, it doesn't detract from the dish whatsoever. Patrick so always wants more of them. So I will. Yeah, it's actually extras. my favorite yes. part of most of the dishes. <laughs> um, so that's it. Before you go to bed, soak that chicken in a wine bath. Okay. Next night, you're coming home, you're gonna strain out the wine, you're gonna strain out the carrots and the onions, and you're gonna get rid of the onions. There's no need to keep those. Um, they just, because we're gonna add pearl onions, which are the super traditional thing. Now you're gonna say to yourself, where do I get pearl onions from? I've seen them at all the grocery stores. Unfortunately, you have to peel them. Mm -hmm. This is what I was asking you when yep. I was texting. I was like, uh, <laughs> right. peel pearl onions. So, uh, they suck to peel. They do, but I Not told people, just like, oh, I told people, like, just put on a show, you know, yeah. <laughs> put on like Ted Lasso or like something feel good. And yeah. just like, or like if you have a child in your home, yeah, that you can make peel. That onions. small finger, small finger labor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But here's the, the trick though, is water that's almost boiling. If you just pour it over the pearl onions and let mm -hmm. them sit in a little container for like two or three minutes, the skins just pop right off. Yeah, that was another thing that I put in there. I was yeah. like, you could just blanch them too. Yep. And that works. But, um, so that's kind of it. So now what we've got is we've got the chicken pulled out, we've got the carrots set aside, and we're gonna strain the wine. The bay leaves look fresh, does that matter? It doesn't, but I prefer fresh bay leaves okay. over dried. I don't know that they're available anywhere except for people who own restaurants. This is also where you get your pearl onions, right? Don't you get them already peeled? Oh, hell yeah. I can't, <laughs> I can't afford to pay people. And also, like, as a cook, like, in, when I was at True in Chicago, like, I peeled, like, 45 pearl onions every day. And it was like, mm -hmm. holy crap. Like, this is, I'm running out of time. You mm -hmm. know, chef's screaming at me. Um, okay. We've got about 750 milliliters of wine left. What we're going to do is reduce it by half. And then what you're looking for is about this much. <gasps> Magic. 
<laughs> and <laughs> this is something that can happen while you're preparing some of the other stuff. It doesn't have to be done ahead of time. It can work while you're cooking other things, multitasking. Now, we've got the bacon. That's the first thing we're gonna start with. If you can't find slab bacon, there's usually thick cut, like Nooski's has a thick cut bacon now. I've seen it at like the Jenny Street. Um, otherwise, you can go to Madison's Hottest Strip Mall next to the Muscle Lounge and Sporting <laughs> Club at Meet People, who makes their own bacon, and you can cut, get some of that cut to whatever slab that you want. I actually called Jenny, and she confirmed this. Correct. I actually called Jenny this morning to confirm oh some other yeah. facts as well, yeah, I, as I, I shamelessly plug my friend's spots. Yeah, so she she confirmed that, and Contest Carnivore can, can do it as well. They were like, oh, yeah. yeah, we're about to smoke. So I, yeah. I try to, like, call before I send the recipe out to folks. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, here's where you can go. Um, I've also used thick cut. <clears throat> thick cut bacon in the past when in a pinch when I need it's it. fine it, it all works out and if you don't like bacon like it can be omitted although it's a pretty significant part of the dish okay so bacon when you're cr uh, crisping up lardones you always start in a cold pan the reason for this is bacon has sugar in the cure and if bacon hits a hot pan it's going to stick and sear right away if you start it out in a cold pan the fat will start to render out a little bit slower and thus like creating its own lubrication and it won't stick to the bottom of the pan. So we'll get that going. I think we're rolling. Science, right? I feel like there are just things that no one ever tells you. Right. That's like one of those things that no one ever tells you. I never knew that. I always just heat the pan first and then yeah. do whatever I'm doing. And that's why I burn my garlic half the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I mean, that's a whole other story that. too. Yeah, that's, that's like the French versus the Italian methods of garlic as well. You know, like in French cooking, you would never put any color on the garlic. Right, yes. And there are dishes that in Italian cooking, you know, where you toast the garlic super hard, which like I really like lean on that flavor a lot in my cooking. Like there's no way I would ever really be upset about garlic having color on it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, except for the sun gold sugo and it mark. Like that's like intentionally like never sees color whatsoever. Right, right. So, if it's helpful I, to anyone else at home too, Nancy said that they got their slab bacon and pearl onions at Metcalf's at Hilldale. Nice. There it is. Okay. Throw that That's out great. There. Um, one of the recipes that I have memorized over the years is the Zuni Cafe chicken. Oh yeah, where absolutely. Where I with fried salads. I have made it now so many times that like it's like a four or five page so recipe. Good. It's wild, but like yeah. I have made it and made it and made it and made it. And I don't need to look at it anymore, but sometimes I do just to like commune with Judy. Um, but like that is one where you never want the garlic to see any color. You right. put it in with the scallions. And I always kind of wondered about that instruction yeah. and where that came from. Yeah. And it sounds like it's French. Yeah. Yep. Turned out. Yeah. Zuni Cafe was great. That's um, the Caesar salad at Zuni Cafe, also legendary, mm -hmm. um, was where the the uh, inspiration for the cauliflower at Mint, Mint Mark came from. Right. I remember asking you, you about that. I think you in your review threatened me. If I ever took it off the menu. I did. I thought, yeah. I thought still I would come, on there. Still I would on there. come to your house. 3,743 <laughs> orders of cauliflower last year. People with like the pandemic. it. Yeah. We need comfort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting the bacon going. As you can see, no sticking. And we want to render these out until absolutely crispy. Do you drain them on paper towels? I will sometimes do that. Um, I either drain them through like a sieve. Um, if I'm cooking like strips of bacon, I'll put them on a paper towel, but we're actually going to scoop the bacon out of this and use the fat to sear the chicken in. Got it. Okay. So this is about the slowest part of the dish right now. Got it. That. The chicken looks very wet because it was in that wine. Yes. Do you want to dry it off first? So you can dry it off or? first, but like I said, we're going to hang out and because it was soaked in alcohol. It's so uh, purple. Much like the Aquanet I used to use for my Mohawk, the alcohol <laughs> kind of draws it, dries it out pretty quickly. Nice. Yeah. I feel like I've done dishes <laughs> like this with like Tempranillo, Garnacha, Rioja, like whatever. Like I will just throw, like Zinfandel if I've got it around. Like I don't know if I use cab necessarily, but like any kind of light bodied red mm. that's like $10. Sure. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that I think was a, a giant misconception in cooking for a very long time, like using like, if you're, you need to use great wines to cook with. Mm -hmm. And like, there's been a lot of studies about it and, and articles that I've read as of recently too. Like they talk about the second, like any wine hits heat, it loses anything that it was really doing. It's, it's a red wine at that point, yeah. you know? And I, 
you know, I've done certain things that have to be wine specific, like short ribs that were braised in, in Muga. And mm. like, um, you know, like I, I think like perhaps like the way the tannins work in Pinot Noir like this, like you can see how stained this chicken is. Yeah. There are other wines that are a little bit lighter that wouldn't classically do that. But yeah. at the same time, like it's whatever you got. I have a box of wine that I've been using for like four or five months in my house for cooking. That is a good idea. Yeah. Like it doesn't go bad. I should do that more often. Yeah. By the way, this wine that we're drinking right now is, uh, this is Beaujolais, just because I love Square so much. Oh, yeah. Like, I love them so much. They're and great. I love Molly at table as well. But this wine specifically is from Square. Um, we are, my husband and I just joined the wine club where you, like, have, you, like, cook a recipe with a certain wine. And I made um, orange chicken the other night. Oh, nice. From this cookbook called Foodheim. Yeah. Foodheim, God, he's the wild funniest. Cookbook. But also, like, I feel like I read through a recipe and I'm like, oh, like five to seven minutes to fry, like, chicken. Eat this. Fine. Cool. Like, whatever. Sure. I ran out of cornstarch. I substituted rice flour. I, like, we figured it out, right? But then I'm like, oh, it's batches. You're frying in batches. You're frying in, like, six batches, yeah. which is not five to seven minutes. That is... Five to seven minutes, six times. Yeah. So, well, that's a big thing. Learned. Like, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> it was when, delicious. It came out well, but when we started offering fried chicken at Mintmark during uh, the pandemic times, the to-go times, is what I guess we'll call them. The to-go uh, times. I love it. <laughs> you know, like I broke down an entire case of chicken, timed it out to what my fryer could handle, and like people were somewhat upset at times because they couldn't get more than whatever orders I could allow. But I was like, I assure you, like, I'm not trying to be stingy. It's just science. Like, <laughs> it is the, the fryer science. can only hold so much. It can only get so hot. I'm not trying to be an asshole about this, but it's like, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's all that stuff's pretty tricky, the timing. And we do have a quick question from Joseph. Um, they asked, can you please uh, specify where in the recipe the garlic gets used? Yeah, as I was making that uh, this morning as a time trial, I noticed that. We're gonna put the garlic in wherever you feel like, and I'm gonna add it in at the end of the mushrooms. That's my fault. Okay. You should talk to my cooks about the discrepancies <laughs> in recipes that I write sometimes. No, but I try to catch them. No. I'm so sorry. That's all right. This is the second time that's happened, I think. All right, there so we've got chicken, a little bit of salt. We're gonna add salt as we go throughout this entire dish. Kosher salt? Kosher salt, sea salt, Himalayan pink salt. Whatever you want. Yeah, I don't care. We'll do this in two batches. Now, here's the trick about this. There has been sugar added to this chicken via the wine. So it's not like searing a normal chicken without any sort of uh, marinade on it, like where the skin can crisp up and get golden brown delicious, or GBD as we refer to it. Uh, it'll sear really fast. Um, so you want to keep an eye on it at this point. Like if this isn't a walk away point from the recipe. And I'll kind of show you some before and after shots. As of right now, like before it goes in, it's pretty dark. And then, as you can see right here, or which camera is me? All right, uh, right there, it's already good to go, right? Now, it may not be absolutely imperative that you sear the chicken for this dish, and if this is out of your comfort zone and you don't wanna burn it, that's fine, just skip it, because you're not gonna get a crispy skin at the end of this dish anyway, you know? Right, oh, so Dan wants to know, is there a bacon alternative for non-cork eaters? Uh, Lindsay? <laughs> I was like, just, I was like I'm sure, yeah, no, somewhere. Uh, I mean, I would assume any sort of- um, Something smoky. Something smoky. I mean, smoky when bags. I have to do that intentionally at Mimark, like I'll smoke mushrooms, but it's like, uh. it's kind of whatever kind of thing that you need to, to get there, like um, smoke mushrooms is a good idea. Yeah, it's Lauren great. Lauren had me use a liquid smoke for something not too long ago. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Liquid smoke is is fine as well, but like, that can get like crazy out of control. So. Li real careful. Liquid real careful. smoke. Easier to add than subtract. Yeah. <laughs> I've also like actually like smoked things at home. Um, sure. For the for the chef book that I just did, the I was smoking apples. That was actually kind of fun. Yeah. Like, 
there was a four quarter recipe where they had these smoking apples, and I was like, whatever. There's a lot of fun things to smoke. Yeah. We're going to do... I quick want to try my best Jerry Seinfeld impression, because I've been watching a lot of Seinfeld, because Andrew asked, what's the deal with the container of water you're putting your utensils in? It's a uh, terrible impression. Let's move past <laughs> it. What is the deal? <laughs> Let me get so these mushrooms in here better. first. <laughs> okay, mushrooms go in. I'll get right to your question. Um, mushrooms go in, and again, we're going to add a little bit of salt. So here's the theory behind the salt, and then we'll get to the water question. Um, I have questions about that. When you are cooking, especially uh, compounding flavors like this, it's important to season each ingredient. And what I've learned is that if you season a little bit, you're working with a dish that tastes wholly seasoned at the end, as opposed to like creating the dish and getting all the way through all the steps and then adding the salt. Like salt has its own taste. Um, it's, it's so important to what we do in cooking. And it's something that I think sets chefs away from home cooks is like I season so aggressively at Mint Mark and like a lot of times I joke they're like well how do you do that and I'm like oh well, I use salt <laughs> um but that's kind of it so Lauren is nodding over yeah here. as you move through any sort of dish that has multiple stages it's important to use just a little bit of salt to kind of season it as a whole as opposed to like trying to like add salt to this finished product Spain with uh spoons in it so in most kitchens, uh, cooks have their tools kept in a bane of water um, to kind of like pull particulates off, kind of clean the spoons. B-A-I-N Marie. Bane Marie, Marie. sure. Um, and then it's, it's one of those things where it keeps you from like setting the spoon on the counter right. with the sauce on it, Maggie. Um, <laughs> It's the same reason why people won't, like, at, in a restaurant, I would never set my wine glass down on the cutting board. Sure. And, like, because health codes. Um, yeah. I do it at home. Yeah, but, like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, you know, never hot pans on a cutting board. There's all, all those totally. kinds of things. But, yeah, it's just, the, it's just where I always keep my tools. They're always water. You know, we keep tasting spoons available for the cooks to try the food. Question about the mushrooms. So I have also read that, like, you might sometimes want to also wait for a couple of minutes to salt mushrooms because of how much liquid they're going to release. Like, if you want your mushrooms to brown or not. Okay, so there's two times to salt. Right off the bat, extracts as much liquid as possible. Right. At the end, keeps moisture in. It draws moisture in. So the reason why with mushrooms, why I go right off the bat, is mushrooms are almost entirely water. Right, which is why you I want them like, to... Up pour out as much as possible as fast as possible cool. yeah. to condense and like eventually like end up kind of back in the mushroom as a condensed flavor so with mushrooms it's important to get them right away got it okay yeah. i don't remember where i read like that you wanted to wait for like a couple of minutes to get them browning at first and then add the salt but it sure. could be just a different end result yep okay so we're looking to get a little bit of color Cast iron enamel yep. situation here. Um, all right, now we're going to add the garlic real quick because I completely forgot that part. And apparently so did I. It's all right. Here we go. Cut something. All right. Give that a quick stir. The garlic is immediately fragrant. Yeah. Do we know, I wonder if Lauren as well could answer, is that an induction burner? It is an it induction is. burner. And I'm only doing this on an induction burner so I don't have my back to you on the entire oh. time. Otherwise, I would definitely be doing this on something Actual with an open flame. flame. Yeah. I had so much garlic from my CSA. Shout out to Vitruvian Farms. Um, that I ran out of it like last week. Oh, wow. Like literally, it has lasted me so long. Um, it's insane. Yes. Like, also, I love, like we've started doing like every other week kind of, we're like, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna like make orders. We've done it a little bit, but we need to do it more. But local farms right, yeah. in the off season, man. Absolutely. 
It's yeah. always a, a sad day when certain farms contact me at Midmark and say like, you know what, we're done for the season. Yeah. We'll see you next summer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I will say I realized recently I went to the farmer's market, which is now at Garber Feed Mill on Saturday morning. And I was like running through, picking up like, I picked up sweet potatoes. I picked up some like delicata squash, some cool stuff. And I put it in the place I normally put it. And I like, it was like a week or something. And it was growing like within a week. <laughs> and I was like, because it's not the storage they have at the farms. I don't have the kind of like good storage that they have um, temperature controlled and all that. This is our kitchen magic for later. <laughs> But yeah, the farmer's market is fully going, I think through, gosh, mid, mid April, late April. All and right. Mushrooms have a good amount of color. As you can see, there's not a lot of moisture left in the bottom of the pan. So again, all that water was extracted with the salt. Now it's drawn back in condensed flavor, a little bit of caramelization. We're going to dump those out. I'm just going to put them in with the chicken. Yeah. And now we get to add some butter. So all the mushrooms classically will absorb as much fat as they possibly can, unless you're like shallow frying them, but that wasn't the case for this. So they absorb a ton of fat. So now we have to reintroduce a new fat to the dish. So we're gonna use butter. It's like a Thanksgiving level of butter right over here. <laughs> it's the only way I can get it. I actually like, I have a hard time like, thinking of anything outside of a kitchen because I've spent so many years like working dumb long shifts and like as my children were growing and like the doctors would be like oh your your son's like 14 pounds or like he's 36 pounds and I was like he is a case of butter <laughs> you know like so I kind of like anytime somebody says anything in weight I'm like okay that's this very this much butter yeah all right next we're gonna do the onions the onions too, we're just gonna try and get a little bit of color on because they're gonna get cooked all the way through in the braise. I can't tell you how many times I just skip pearl onions because they're a pain in my butt. You yeah. can get them frozen. They have them peeled and frozen. There's like a bird's eye frozen pearl onion. That would actually that probably used. work. Yeah, I it, think does. Be fine. it does work. Um, At home once in a while, I use Trader, Gro Trader Joe's like frozen garlic tabs. Mm. They have like mashed garlic. Oh, wow. And like these little like um, ice cube trays. Huh. And it's like, you just pop one out right towards the end. And it's like, it and it works? It. Yeah, it's awesome. That's cool. Right. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, usually I'm ending up peeling pearl onions when Patrick, oh, I, I send Patrick a, you know, store with a list and he comes back with the kind I have to peel. But like, I honestly, <laughs> when I skip them, like they're so good. Yeah, they're, they're great. so sweet. They're yeah. so lovely. And they have a different kind of texture in the dish, I think, than just a chopped up onion, which is usually what I substitute. Sure. No, I mean, we use them at Mintmark in the form of a pickled pearl onion. We do the, oh, yeah. the PPO, where they're pickled in kava vinegar and pink peppercorns and thyme and coriander. Is um, it a cocktail garnish? Nope. No, no, because I, no, I always use them up. I never let them use it. <laughs> uh, it could be. It could be. It could be. And you know what? My bar team is so good that they would be able to handle their own pickling program as well. Yeah. I mean. But they probably know if they started doing it, they'd just be doing it for the whole team <laughs> and it'd be off the cook's plate. So we're looking for, uh, again, some GBD on these onions, a little golden brown delicious. As soon as they get just to that point, I'm gonna add the carrots in. Uh, the carrots, I'm not looking for a ton of color on either. Probably just about there. Oh yeah, great. Moving right along. Pick it up, pick it up. had a Muppets childhood, so that it has Muppet. Yeah, Muppets. I can only relate to the two old guys that heckle. <laughs> the heckling? anymore, yeah. Sattler and Waldorf. Yeah, they're the best. Well, that and my like, affinity for dad jokes. Like, they, that, that humor really, really hits I me I mean, Sat Sattler and Waldorf are, are kind of like the, the iconic critics, right? They're just yeah. like up in the gallery, heckling, you know? That's what we do. It's the dream. <laughs> Again, a little bit of salt as we're moving along. Any questions from the audience? None yet. I must be doing a great Lately, job. Lately, let's see. No, no. Dave, are you out there? Dave? <laughs> Dave. Toy? 
<laughs> Tori. Where's Toy? Toy, are you watching? <laughs> Tori's running a restaurant. Right no, now. Toy. There's this one oh. named Toy who comes. Oh, they said Tori. I was no, like, Tori's not, not watching me. No. <laughs> he doesn't have time for a guy like me. I'm just a guy rubbing two sticks together, you know? Dan says, three cheers for Bella and the bar team. Yay. Yeah. Oh, okay, we have a question. Liz Gerber asks, Sean, do you always peel your own garlic or buy it already peeled? I buy it already peeled, Liz. I think you know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Liz Gerber? Uh, Liz is uh, one of our great bartenders at Mint Mark mm. and also a workout buddy of mine. Ah. Okay, cool. Wow. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> my, my good friend Joanna always buys it already peeled and I always ask, oh, like, how much time does it actually take to peel? But if you're doing a lot, it's a lot. So there's like... Trust me, it's like one of those battles that I had, mm -hmm. right? And it's, there is a distinct difference in pre-peeled garlic and garlic that you have to peel yourself. Garlic that you have to peel yourself is far superior. It's great. What happens when you peel it and you put it in a thing? I mean... Does it lose its... Well, I'm assuming the machines that they use to peel it, I'm sure it's like uh... a shaking thing, so the garlic sometimes get a bit, gets a bit bruised. But it's like, it's one of those things as a restaurant owner, I'm sure you can attest to this as well, it's like... There are times where you can pay somebody to stand around and peel garlic. Right. Or you can like have them grab the garlic <laughs> and continue on. Right. You know? I've got um, three questions. All right. I mean, we asked and I yeah, mean, we let's received. Do it. Okay. <laughs> we're, uh, this is maybe I'll do a two in one here because Cheryl and Katie Dean, shout out to Katie Dean for watching, the executive editor at the Cap Times. Oh, nice. Hey, Katie um, Dean. <laughs> They both are asking about the carrots. So were the carrots partially raw, raw or cooked or partially cooked or raw? And then and then also, should you peel the carrots or just scrub them well? I peeled the carrots. They went in raw. And to further expound on that, they are what I call, an, like what is called an oblique cut. Um, again, with all the things that I've kind of thrown away in my 20 plus years of cooking is like, Brunois and small dice and all these like super regulated knife cuts like Brunois is like super tight. I don't know, man. This looks more appealing to me than like a like a one eighth by one eighth by one eighth or yeah. a half inch by half inch by half inch. Like it just looks a little more rustic. It looks more appealing. The corners and like the edges catch a lot of color when you're roasting them. It's just I don't know. For me, it's not about like the fancy stuff anymore. It's about what's gonna taste great, what's gonna move it along. And then. Sarah asked, is discarding the wine-soaked onions strictly because we're adding the pearl onions? I assume they'd be okay to add in if we don't want to waste them, right? Yeah, you can totally throw them in there. It doesn't really matter. I probably wouldn't, like, cook them too far. I'd add them in right at the end stage, again, because of the sugar thing with them. But yeah. uh, they'll, you could totally use them. It's just pearl onions are absolutely classic. All right, so we're at a great spot with this dish. We are going to add the bacon back in. We're going to add the mushrooms and the chicken back in. Actually, we're going to add the mushrooms first. Some of the herbs from the marinade can go back in now as well. We're going to add a little bit of tomato paste. I've even taken on this at uh, the restaurants, I buy small, small cans of tomato paste. In the past, you could only buy like number 10 cans of tomato paste, which is like five pounds of tomato paste, which nobody has ever gone through. I hope nobody has ever gone through. Um, so I buy like small, small cans. I think they're like two ounces, three ounces. I buy uh, squeezies. That way you can get through them. Squeezies are awesome too. Well, tubes. Yeah, for like home, tubes. I buy the squeezies. Yep. Um, but we're gonna coat everything in tomato paste right now. This adds a little bit of more caramelization, a little bit of sweetness, robustness, and tomato paste acts as a thickening agent. Yeah, totally. Next, we're gonna add a little bit of flour. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit of flour. This is a technique in French called sangé, where you dust the dish in flour. And sangé is a small amount of flour added to a dish to thicken it. Now, if you were to add more flour than this, you'd get giant clumps. And you, everybody has made gravy where they try and thicken it up a little bit more by adding more flour. Yeah. And you get those little snowballs floating around in your in your gravy. Um, sangé is just enough to like lightly dust 
over the top. And this again is a thickening agent. You can omit this. It, can you substitute cornstarch or rice flour? You, I would not substitute cornstarch. Okay. But I would make a slurry at the end with cornstarch. And that, cause that thickens it too, yeah, right? Yeah, that thickens yeah. it too. Carol did want to uh, know, is skinless chicken breast okay, or will you miss too much of the fat from dark meat and skin? Skinless chicken breast is okay, but your cooking time is going to be way less. I would almost uh, do all the vegetables, let those cook for a while, and then drop the chicken breast in for like 15 minutes, because they're going to get rocked otherwise. All right, here we are. We're at a spot where everything's caramelized. Uh, paste it up, Sanjade. We're going to add the liquids in. So this is the reduced red wine. Whoa. This is some chicken stock. You can use chicken broth. Um, our friends at Meat People, located in Madison's Hottest Strip Mall, <laughs> next to the Muscle Lounge and Sporting Club, uh, offer their own beef broth and chicken broth, and as does my buddy Dave over at Conscious Carnivore. They both have uh, great products that you can get your hands on without having to buy giant bones. I have also cheated and used bouillon. Yeah, I mean, you don't find a lot of stock at my household. I mean, I I do stock in the winter, but especially in the summer. Yeah. I you know. And I have all the different like it's like a better than bouillon paste kind of stuff. Oh yeah, that's stuff's nice, yeah. great. Yeah. A lot of salt, so you got to be careful. Um, Cuz this will reduce, so yeah. that's part of the deal. All right, we're going to add the chicken in. It does not have to be submerged. It's so warmy. Yeah, it's awesome. Like the colors are really nice. I feel like anything at this time of year that has a lot of color. That's nice, right? It's so important. Well, but also, I think a lot of foods should be beige and white in winter. Like if you're truly cooking with what seasons need to be. Right. That's what we have available. Rutabaga, right turnip. Yep, absolutely. I set a lid down right here. All right. In braising, anything you do braising, what I would like you to do is make sure everything comes up to a simmer first before you put it in the oven. It just makes sure it makes sure that everything is moving along at the rate that it's supposed to, as opposed to like starting from cold. Um, your cook times in the oven will go a lot longer if you start from cold. So thankfully this dish is already hot and good to go, but, and it won't take long for this to come up. Right there it is. All right, 350 degree oven for 45 minutes. It's steamy oven. Of course, everybody at home has a combi oven, of course. <laughs> you know, like the... <laughs> I, re I learned relatively, embarrassingly recently that that just means combination. <laughs> nice. I'm like, cool. Now, through the magic of TV, <laughs> we have Kogavan. So everything's thickened Ooh. up. The chicken is cooked through. You can see that it's kind of peeling from the top of the bone. That's the sign that a chicken leg and thigh is, is set to go nice and tender. And it's only 45 minutes. So cook time ran 45 minutes. No, I guess we talked for a minute. It's about 30 minutes of cooking and then 45 minutes of cooking. So uh, in the oven. So there it is. The way I like to serve this, and this is actually a super traditional way to do it as, uh, as beef bourgogne, uh, is the is with buttered noodles. Uh, one of my, Bistro Janty in Napa Valley, one of my favorite restaurants of all time. It's like lexicon of classic French dishes, like served it with just egg noodles covered in a little bit of butter. Um, otherwise, this is great on top of mashed potatoes. It's great on top of polenta. Um, it's also great the next day. If you make it the day before and let it hang out and just reheat it, it's perfect. Yeah, so. that's awesome. So it, um, one of my coworkers was asking for the recipe today, and she's like, oh my gosh, like six to eight people, eight people that I gotta cut this down. And I was like, yeah, cut it in half, but make that much. Yeah. And then you'll yeah. have some leftover. And it also, I feel like it freezes pretty well, honestly. Like I've had frozen versions of this. I usually pull the chicken and like just freeze the rest of it sure. and then use that. Um, Actually, one of my favorite ways that I, learned this dish was at a restaurant a long time ago called Coco Lico. Uh, that was what, like 15 years ago, probably? It's classic. That's like yeah. the, what Papavro came out yeah. of. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's where we prepped With actually. Francesca, yeah. yeah. That's where Francesco and I prepped all the Yay. time. Yay. Oh. Uh, so, 
um, what we did is we made this dish, then we picked the meat off and we made crepes and folded it within the crepe and then garnished it with yeah. the carrots and the jus over the top. So, I mean, beautiful. there's a lot of variations you can do with this. But at the end of the day, this is a really simple dish. It takes a little bit of planning, but it's like six ingredients. Uh, it's not that hard. It's like intermediate level cooking and it's delicious. It's, it's a classic for a reason. Classics don't go out of style. You know? We have a couple more things. We have a little bit of time, so I just want to get through these questions, of course, because yeah. we want to... So thankful for everybody for watching at home. And this was our third most RSVP slash registered event. So thank you, Chef Just Don. number three. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren's like, maybe right some here. Lauren Montalbano, who is here. She's in number two spot. <laughs> Evan, uh, number Daniel. one, Evan. Oh, Evan's awesome. Yeah. They were our, our first two shows. He's got shows. full sleeve tattoos, that's why, right? <laughs> that's probably that why. why. So, uh, Lauren and Evan were our first two Cooking yeah. with the Cap Times last year. So, it's impressive, Sean, that you came in third. <laughs> so well into the season <laughs> of like Cooking with Cap Times. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for doing that to me. Um, we will <laughs> send out, well <laughs> we will to send out the recipe to anybody me. who missed it. It's also, uh, we'll post it again in the Slack. And, or in the in the Slack, are we at work? In the Zoom, there it is again, Chris. A couple last minute questions and so many wonderful words, people saying they love the show, Lindsay and, and John. Um, so about the time, let me find the question quick. Um, oh my gosh, uh, so many tips on raising the bar. Let's see, I lost it now. There's last minute so many things in here. Um, recipe said to save the time, do the sprigs just go in with the veggies? Yep, they went in at the end with the veggies there. Okay. In there, whole stem, so you can pick them out. Awesome. And then I think we just had one other question from our friend, or is he Fred Swanson, who's watching. Hey Fred. Hey Fred. If you're pickling many of the vegetables that you're, yet, that you're using at Mint Mark, are you doing a quick pickle of about 24 hours? Most of my pickles are something that needs to hang out for about four or five days before it really rings out, except for like pickled shallots and pickled ramps and pickled pearl onions because it's a smaller format and that will take within 12 hours. Um, but uh, most of I mean, like the, the solution is always almost equal parts water and vinegar and then a lot of it's, a, you know, a little bit less sugar. It's almost three parts of that kind of stuff. Um, and it takes about, depending on the size of the vegetable, you know, five to 10 days to fully grab the acidity and the balance of what's happening on in the, the pickling liquid. But definitely like pickled shallots, like the thin slice stuff, that's like 12 hours. You've also and done a lot with terrines. Are you still doing some stuff with terrines? I am still doing a lot with terrines. I've actually had the pleasure of teaching my sous chef guy and kind of handing those off to him. He's done cool. yeah. an absolutely incredible job, but that's something that I, I love to do and I, I love the fact that my business partner Chad said those won't sell and you know I move you know 13 to 15 orders of churning a night. I love yeah. them so I know much. you guys do. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Yeah, I, I order yeah. them a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it's certainly a passion of mine and I hope to in the future uh, develop that as a business in town here, but I don't know how niche that is, you know. It, so. I mean it is a bit, but I feel like that's part of what's growing is stuff that you can have that's yeah, I mean, that's something yeah. no one will do at home. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, Nobody wants to make it, yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and rightly so, it takes forever. And yeah. And so many ingredients and so much equipment, so much patience. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to echo, before we wrap up, I yeah. want to echo Nancy here, because uh, they said, thank you so much. I will join every time. Sean, thank you for your generosity. You, Lindsay, Nancy. you were awesome. Yay! Right. Um, and thank of course, you. we echo that. Mark said, thank you. My kitchen smells amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells really along. good nice. here. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Post some pictures. If you cooked along, we want to see. Yeah. So yeah. Henry said, yeah, baby, terrains by Sean. Now I have to make one since you challenged us. I mean. Yeah, do it. Um, anything else before we sign off? Oh, can I plug something? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to be doing, at the beginning of February, February 2nd, um, I'm doing a book event with Francesca Hong at Mystery to Me. And so Ooh. it's going to be over Zoom, um, but it's going to be really cool. And we're going to be talking about, you know, all the wonderful things that Francesca does, but also a little bit about the, the Madison Chef's book, which is out. Um, so that'll be fun if you want to tune in on Zoom. It's another Zoom thing. We're doing a lot of Zoom things these days, but uh, it should be fun. And so. I swear you answered this, but Chris, Chris Murphy, our colleague, is insisting that you did not. Oh. How long should we cook the dish you made? 45 today? minutes. 
at 40, 350 degrees. Five minutes. Yeah. He answered his own question. Chris, you know, you know this already. He answered his own question there. I think only um, the garlic was Oh, uh, Kara said everybody should get Lindsay's new book, Madison oh Shafts. Oh, amazing. <laughs> um, oh, let's repeat for Joseph. What was the date for the Mystery to Me event? Oh, February 2nd. I think it's a Wednesday. Does that sound right? Sounds February right, 2nd? right. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll share it on the Cap Time Mystery social media. Me. Yeah. You said the fifteenth. The second. Oh. <laughs> uh, Twenty twenty five. Before we sign, I can come over here. Although I took my mask off, I just want to thank the sponsors one more time before we sign off tonight. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Provision Market at Pasquale's Cantina. Make sure you stop by their newly opened market on East Wash. We want to thank, of course, Kessenix, where we are this evening. Come in, shop like a chef at Kessenix. And we want to thank this month's beer sponsor, uh, Oso Brewing Company, for a delish beer. Awesome. So, I'd thank like to thank you. everybody real quick at Mint Mark, my family there, uh, <laughs> all the cooks that put up with me and my going to the other places and dealing with my personal life and uh, family. And I'd like to thank my family at the Muscle Lounge. Uh, I love all of you very much. And I wouldn't be able to get to even come here and do these kinds of things if it weren't for you guys. Stop. So thank you very much. Yay. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Shaf. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Right, Good night, guys. guys. Thank you. Good night.